It might surprise you to learn that 20 years ago, no one was clamoring for a historical epic about Roman gladiators starring an unproven leading man. Fast forward halfway into 2000 and Gladiator had surpassed all expectations, cleaning up at the box office. Fast forward another nine months and Russell Crowe was a household name who just won his first Best Actor Oscar and the film itself went on to win Best Picture. A deluge of historical and often hysterical movies would follow as Hollywood dusted off the sandals and unsheathed the sword once again. Still, there are a fair few tidbits of trivia about this incredibly popular and acclaimed movie that not so many people are aware of, even so many years later. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com, and these are 20 things you didn't know about Gladiator. Number 20, Spielberg approved the original pitch. Original screenwriter David Franzioni came across the book Those Who Are About to Die by Daniel P. Mannix when traveling around the world after college in the 1970s. And two decades later, given a three-picture deal with DreamWorks in recognition of his work on Steven Spielberg's Amistad, Gladiator was his first pitch, which the director accepted after a short meeting. However, Franzioni's original script was much more historically accurate. His protagonist was a gladiator called Narcissus, the man who actually strangled Commodus, and Lucilla was, as in real life, executed inside a brazen bull, which was an infamous Greek torture and execution device made of bronze in which its victims were roasted alive. Yeah, doesn't sound pleasant. Number 19, there were dozens of drafts of the screenplay. Franzioni's version may have kicked off the development process, but it didn't survive it, as you might have guessed. As mentioned, his 130-page script is different in pretty much every single detail from the film that was eventually made. That's because when Ridley Scott came on board as director, he thought Franzioni's dialogue was, quote, too on the nose. And he brought in playwright John Logan, whose recent spec script, Any Given Sunday, was then in development with Oliver Stone. Over several drafts, Logan rewrote wrote most of Act 1, electing to motivate his protagonist by having his family murdered. However, with two weeks to go before filming, the actors and actresses were still complaining of problems with the script. Despite the number of drafts and the number of writers who'd worked on the project, when filming began in January 1999, Scott still started shooting without a finished screenplay, just 30 odd pages to go on. Number 18, Phoenix was the first choice for Commodus. Up and coming young actor Joaquin Phoenix was always Ridley Scott's first choice to play Commodus although at one point Jude Law was in consideration as well. Phoenix was only 24 at the time, and Gladiator was the biggest movie of his career, so he was understandably very nervous. Actually, nervous wasn't the word, at least according to Crow, he would ask to be, quote, roughed up before going on camera in order to get into the right headspace. Worried, Crow asked Sir Richard Harris for advice, who suggested just taking Phoenix out on the pints. There's also a story that, while checking out the dailies, Ridley Scott thought Phoenix might might have put on a little weight during the shoot. Word filtered back to Phoenix that the legendary director thought that he was a bit tubby, which apparently had been a specific choice the actor made to point to Commodus' debauchery as a corrupt emperor. Still, reacting to the criticism, Phoenix starved himself for weeks to take off the weight that he'd added. Number 17, Russell Crowe wasn't Scott's first choice for Maximus. Two decades, multiple awards, and an impressive legacy later, it's tricky to even imagine the film with a different actor in the leading role. However, believe it or not, Russell Crowe wasn't Ridley Scott's first choice. Mel Gibson was offered it first, no doubt with visions of his performance as William Wallace at the front of the producers' minds. Gibson turned it down though, conscious that in his early 40s, he might be too old for the physically demanding role. Supposedly, Hugh Jackman and Antonio Banderas were also considered, but eventually it was decided to go for Crowe. Number 16, Crowe nearly passed on the project. At first, Russell Crowe had no interest in being in this movie. He was knee-deep at the time and working with Michael Mann on the role of Jeffrey Wigand in The Insider, a part which had required him to age up nearly 20 years. It was Mann himself who persuaded him to take another look at Gladiator, though. The script itself didn't do it, obviously. I mean, Scott didn't even have a draft that he liked, so it was literally just the experience of working with the director of Alien and Blade Runner that sealed the deal. However, this script did continue to cause all kinds of problems for Crow on set, and he had plenty of confrontations with Scott that resulted in him simply walking off. Still, the experience as emotional and physically grueling as it was, ended up being incredibly rewarding for all concerned. Maximus is still one of Crow's favorite roles two decades later. Number 15, making it up as he went along. The main problem with an unfinished shooting script is that actors need dialogue, and what Crow had to work with was often not up to scratch. He'd end up rewriting plenty of lines himself while on location, scrambling to find something of value in what little he had. One key example was Maximus's description of his home in Spain. The kitchen garden, the smells, 
all that good stuff. That was improvised and actually a description of Crow's own farm in Australia. Even the name itself was ad-libbed. Crow hated Narcissus, the name of the gladiator when he signed up, and nothing had caught his imagination either. He went with Maximus Decimus Meridius on the spur of the moment on set because he liked the way it rolled off the tongue. Number 14, Crow was Marmite even back then. Russell Crowe's relationship with Scott extended beyond Gladiator and they've made several movies together since and the director has nothing but warm words for his frequent collaborator. However, Crow has long been notorious for being that odd mixture of pretentious artist and unpretentious Aussie farmer. And that combined with a certain prickly attitude and his infamous bluntness has made him Marmite for an awful lot of the people he's encountered over the years. The late Oliver Reed was one such individual. The famous thespian took an instant dislike to Crow and at one point even threatened to fight him during a confrontation on set. Again though, this antagonistic relationship worked in Scott's favour, as after all, Proximo and Maximus were at loggerheads in the beginning too. Number 13, Crow was badly hurt over the course of the shoot. Remember Gladiator's forest-based opening battle and the stitches over Maximus's face afterwards? Well, that's not makeup. Crow's horse actually startled and forced him into tree branches which ripped at his face. The gladiatoral scenes weren't a picnic either. During a sword fighting scene, Crow's right forefinger was bashed and it took him two years to get the feeling back. During the course of that long, grueling shoot, he also broke his foot, cracked a hip during a fall, and exacerbated an old bicep injury from when he was training to be a gymnast in a movie for Jodie Foster. All in all, it sounds like a massively punishing shoot. Number 12, Animal Crackers. Many of the animals used in the production were lent to them by a Moroccan zoo. For the fight between Maximus and Tigris the Gaul, there were five real tigers present, along with a vet with a tranquilizer gun. Although tigers are very hard to train, these cats acted like seasoned Hollywood pros, getting so used to all of the movie-making hullabaloo around them that they'd often fall asleep and need prodding awake. Despite this, Crow still kept the mandatory 15 feet away from the stripy nightmares of nature, you know, just in case. The tigers actually entered the arena via trapdoors in the floor, a method the gladiators used at one point as well. Both the elevators used to do this were operated by winch and pulley, just like the original versions that would have been used in the Colosseum in Rome. Number 11, they genuinely burnt a forest down. Remember that opening battle scene in the Germanian woods I already asked you to remember earlier? Well, it wasn't just Crow's face that got marked up. The scene was filmed in Bourne Woods in Surrey, a county in southern England. The area was already e-marked by the UK's Royal Forestry Commission for Deforestation, so Ridley Scott, sensing a collision of fates, offered them his crew services to take care of it for them, an offer that the commission were pleased to accept. This cleared a big enough area to stage the battle they were looking for and afterwards gave the commission the idea to loan the woods out to future productions such as Children of Men, The Golden Compass, three Harry Potter movies, three MCU movies, and Wonder Woman. Number 10, it took a significant effort to create the Colosseum. Opinions differ as to why, but the Gladiator production elected to build a model of the Roman Colosseum in Malta rather than film in the real thing. Some say it's because Ridley Scott decided that the Colosseum itself was too small, while Russell Crowe insists that they just couldn't get. Anyway, the colossal Colosseum they built Built was only a fraction, a third to a half, of the actual colossal Colosseum, constructed from plaster and plywood to be 52 foot tall. Both real life extras and cardboard cutouts were used to feign the sold out crowds they need on camera, and 2,000 or so real people in costume thronged to the lower two levels, shot from different angles and digitally motion captured and mapped to digitally duplicate them across the whole structure. Number 9, Connie Nielsen is a genius. Connie Nielsen, who plays Lucilla and who speaks eight languages by the way, is an amateur historian specializing in ancient Rome, whose surprisingly in-depth knowledge of the period ended up being a godsend for the production. She was consulted on many occasions over historical accuracy and proved an invaluable resource on location. Supposedly, Nielsen found the signet ring she wears in the movie in an antique store as well, and even more supposedly, it was the genuine article, 2,000 years old, which is the kind of trivia tidbit that sounds just too unlikely to be true, and consequently is actually probably true. Number eight, Oliver Reed was difficult. Quite apart from the near fisticuffs between Reed and Crow, Reed could be hard to deal with in general. An alcoholic for many, many years, the acting legend was quick to anger and, astonishingly, suffered fools even less gladly than the film's straight-talking leading man and famously gruff director. The late Michael Winner had persuaded him to audition. Reed was miffed at the very idea, apparently, though, claiming that he was too famous to try out for roles, but Winner soon put him in his place, saying, quote, Oliver, don't f*** with me. 
You're not a f***ing star. You're out of work and you're not old enough to retire, so you need a third act to your career. Obviously, they think if you're working with me, you can't be as drunk as people think you are. So go to Ridley and read. End of story, Oliver. And if he wants you to read twice, read twice. Number seven, so was Richard Harris. In the ongoing list of volatile stars, Sir Richard Harris wasn't exactly the easiest of people to deal with either. And he'd been off the hard stuff for a long time too. Much like Oliver Reed, when you hire a legendary hell-raising actor like Harris, even in his twilight years, you have to expect to be screwed with a little, and you have to expect that he won't be messed around. The lack of a lock shooting script might have given Russell Crowe a headache, but Harris dealt with it in a fairly straightforward manner. Since he couldn't be bothered to have to learn new lines all over again at the last minute, he would generally just completely ignore any freshly rewritten scenes. Number six, Oliver Reed was nearly recast after his death. The original climax to the movie would have seen Maximus forced to fight Proximo in the Colosseum. Friend against friend is a last little twist of the nice from Commodus, with the final scene being Proximo himself burying the figurines in the sand where Maximus had died. However, during a break from shooting three weeks prior to the end of filming, Oliver Reed visited a bar where he was persuaded to abandon his self-imposed moratorium on booze and enter a drinking competition. Reed being Reed, he was doing rather well when he suffered a heart attack and tragically passed away. There was an offer to reshoot his scenes with a new actor, but Scott simply didn't want to replace Reed in the film. Most of his scenes were in the bag and he'd hired him for a reason, which the legendary actor had more than delivered on. The decision was made then. They would tweak the ending instead and the performance would stay in. Number five, period inauthenticity part one. Thumbs up or thumbs down. The picture that Walter Parks used to sell Scott on making the movie was called Police Verso, which translates as thumbs down. Or at least it would if you weren't mangling the language like I just did. It is commonly believed that Roman officials would spare the lives with a thumbs up and order them ended with a thumbs down. Historically speaking, that isn't correct though. The thumb gesture actually represented a sword's thrust, and up meant death, while down meant sheathed. Gladiator's cast and crew were fully aware of this widespread misconception, but chose to ignore it for the same reason that Crow's request that his Spanish character should speak in a Spanish accent was also turned down. The audience expected something else, and giving them an authentic detail instead would only confuse matters and disrupt their suspension of disbelief. Number four, period inauthenticity part two, the Emperor's Fall. This wasn't the only little slice of inauthenticity in the movie, of course. Take the murder of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, for instance. In real life, the man died of the plague, not patricidal strangling. Commodus wasn't despised by his people either, at least not at first. Much loved by both the army and the lower classes, Commodus fell from favor over time because of his increasingly bizarre and arrogant behavior. He was known to his people as a gladiator emperor due to his performances in the Colosseum, routing wild animals for the entertainment of the masses. However, the emperor would charge the Senate a vast amount of money for each of these public appearances, leading to a fall in the value of the currency. His behavior worsened in the arena as well, where he segued from wild animals to the vicious clubbing to death of disabled and sick prisoners, many of whom he roped together. The people saw their fighting emperor reduce himself to the status of torturer and were not entertained. Number three, Maximus's breastplate tells a story all on its own. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that after becoming a gladiator, Maximus's breastplate begins to change. It starts off with representations of two griffins around the abdominal region, typically representing strength and bravery. For every victory in the arena though, Maximus adds something new in silver. First, a sprouting tree trunk that then blossoms into a poplar tree, the same trees that lined the avenue leading to his desecrated home, and then two rearing horses, Argento and Scatto, the horses that were taken from him. Next, under the horse on the right breast, two figures, one large and one small, representations of the general's murdered wife and child. As Maximus gets close to achieving his revenge, his trophies are displayed on his armor. They're icons of the beloved things he He's lost home, horses, family, and reputation that he intends to avenge. And as an aside, the names of those two horses are Hollywood in jokes as well. Argento is Latin for silver and Scatto for latch, literally silver and trigger, the names of the horses belonging to the Lone Ranger and legendary movie cowboy Roy Rogers, respectively. Number two, the gladiator effect. Gladiator's impact as a movie ranges far beyond the many historical epic dramas, think Kingdom of Heaven, Troy 300, Alexander, and so many more that were greenlit in its wake. The film's huge commercial and critical success caused a significant spike in interest in classical Roman myth and history in America, a phenomenon that's been nicknamed the gladiator effect. In particular, Cicero biography Cicero, The Life and Times of Roman's Greatest Politician, and Gregory Hayes' translation of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations 
shot up the non-fiction bestseller lists. And if you were looking for a modern day equivalent of Commodus, then Jack Gleason, aka Game of Thrones' as Joffrey, confirmed that Phoenix's performance as Commodus was a big influence on how he chose to play the most hated teenager in television history. Number one, an insane sequel was written. Shortly after Gladiator's release, Scott and Russell Crowe approached acclaimed singer-songwriter Nick Cave with a view to writing a sequel. Years after the fact, Cave's amazing first draft managed to make its way online, and it has to rank as one of the weirdest and most awesome missed opportunities in cinematic history. First and foremost, Cave believed he'd solved the problem of Maximus dying in the first movie. Quote, For someone who had only written one film script, it was quite an ask. Hey Russell, didn't you die in Gladiator 1? Yeah, you sought that out. So he goes down to purgatory and is sent down by the gods who are dying in heaven because there's this one god, there's this Christ character down on earth who is gaining popularity and so the many gods are dying so they send Maximus back to kill Christ and his followers. You want more? Well, there's more. He went on to say, I wanted to call it Christ Killer, and in the end you find out that the main guy was his son, so he has to kill his son, and he was tricked by the gods. He becomes this eternal warrior, and it ends with this 20 minute war scene which follows all the wars in history, right up to Vietnam, and all that sort of stuff, and it was wild. Russian tanks, it was a stone cold masterpiece. You know what? I think I believe him. That sounds ridiculous and awesome and good. And we've done more videos covering this topic because we can't get enough of it. So check those out too. So that's our list. I want to see what you guys think down in the comments below. Do you have an itch to rewatch Gladiator after watching this video? And how many of these tidbits did you already know beforehand? Either way, while you're down there, could you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't though, I've been Josh. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.